The institutional sharks are circling Palantir and you might be swimming in dangerous waters without even realizing it. Felix here and today we're diving deep into the turbulent seas of Palantir stock. As we approach the potential S&P inclusion on September 20th, the waters are getting increasingly choppy. We've seen massive institutional buying with some funds increasing their positions by a staggering 2.4 million percent. But is this a feeding frenzy you want to join or should you be wary of what lurks underneath the surface? In this video, we'll analyze the recent institutional buying patterns, explore the positive catalysts that could propel Palantir to higher heights and examine the challenges that might just sink your investment. We'll also do a technical analysis to help you navigate these treacherous waters. You know where the support and the resistance sits. And if you think that technical analysis is a load of hogwash, I used to think that, but I now use it every single day and we're up 80% so far in our trading portfolio for the year. So you, maybe you want to learn those little secrets for free join our live beginner trading training on Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Just sign up at felixfriends.org slash webinar. Link is down below. But let's dive into the data and see what's happening with Palantir stock. If we follow the money trail and we see where the big institutional investors are placing their bets on Palantir, well, the recent flood of institutional buying has been extraordinary with some truly eye-popping numbers that would make the most seasoned investor do a double take. Let's look at the new major buyers here. Berkshire Focus Fund, Berkshire Capital Holdings have both taken substantial positions. They have nothing to do with the Warren Buffett Berkshire, by the way, but they're not alone in this buying street. We've got Marshall Waste LLP, made a three and a half million share a buy of almost $90 million, so almost a 600% increase in their position. So they've decided to seriously upgrade their exposure here. And then we've got Dark Forest Capital Management. That sounds like a lovely firm, doesn't it? Who calls their investment in vehicle Dark Forest Capital? Anyway, they've increased their stake by 1,200%. They now own 17 million. Tocqueville Asset Management growing their position by 900%. Uh, and so on. They've got loads of these guys. They're just chopping up and up and up and up their Palantir shareholders. But what's particularly interesting is the diversity of institutional interest. They're not just all tech-focused jumps jumping in on this tech thing. We're seeing mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, and ETFs getting involved. For instance, Ilmarinen Mutual Pensions Insurance Company has taken 100,000 shares. ETF like the Timothy Plan U.S. Large Cap Core ETF and iShares Factors U.S. Growth Style ETF have added to their portfolio. And let's not forget about the whales in this ocean of institutional investors. The ones that we've been discussed previously, remember that one? Yeah, Norge Bank still holds a massive 11.2 million share portfolio here, which is a $285 million stake just in Palantir. So what does all this institutional buying really signify? Well, it suggests growing confidence in Palantir's prospects. The diversity of investors from tech funds to broad market ETFs indicates a wide ranging appeal. It could be driven by a combination of things. Palantir is improving financials, its growing role in AI and data analytics, and of course, the anticipated boost from potential S&P 500 inclusion. But this is where we need to put our critical thinking caps on. While this institutional interest is definitely noteworthy, it's crucial to remember that these big players often have different investment horizons and risk tolerances than you and me. They might be playing a long game that doesn't align with your personal, you know, two or three year horizon or one month horizon, whatever it is. And as we move closer to September 20th, the potential S&P 500 inclusion, it'll be crucial to watch for any further significant institutional moves they could impact the stock price and trading volume very, very significantly. But let's shift gears for a moment and explore the positive catalysts that could potentially propel Palantir stock much higher. First and foremost, the elephant in the room, we have the potential S&P 500 inclusion on September 20th. This isn't just a feather in Palantir's cap, it's more like strapping a jet engine onto our metaphorical rocket here. When a company joins the S&P 500, it's, well, you're included in the big league. You are now going to be tracked by every index fund out there that tracks the S&P 500 and they therefore all have to buy your shares, potentially creating significant demand. Moreover, many institutional investors use the S&P 500 benchmark, which could lead to even more buying pressure. But 
there is more potential good news. Rate cuts by the Fed could be another booster for growth stocks like Palantir. When interest rates drop, it often makes high growth tech stocks more attractive to investors. And don't forget Palantir's improving financials. In the last quarterly report, they showcased a 27% year over year revenue growth, reaching $678 million, and they reported a $134 million gap net income, which is a 20% margin. And lastly, we can't ignore Palantir's growing role in AI and data analytics, as businesses and governments are increasingly relying on data driven solutions, Palantir becomes more and more crucial to them. Now, this paints kind of a promising picture, doesn't it? But you got to remember, the stock market is somewhat unpredictable. These positive factors could indeed propel Palantir to you know, the moon where we'd like it to be, but there are risks to consider. So what are those risks? What are those challenges? Well, first on the radar is the infamous September effect. And as we're now well and truly into September, historically, September has been the worst month for the stock market performance. And the second half of September is truly horrific. It's sort of as if the market decides to have a bit of a sulk after the long summer holiday, like we don't want to go back to work yet. From 1928 to 2021, the S&P has declined by 1% during this month on average. Now, past performance and so on, but when everybody believes it, it's fairly likely to be true. And so far, we, are, we seem to be on that path for sure. And then we have recession fears. They continue to loom over us like a dark cloud. And tech stocks like Palantir could be particularly vulnerable to recession fears. The growth-oriented business model of a Palantir could face some headwinds, impacting revenue growth and profitability if large companies decide to just, just put everything on pause for a moment while the economy recovers. That's often what happens. Not logical, but it's often what happens. And another point of contention is Palantir's valuation. Last time I checked, Palantir was trading at a forward PE of about 72, which is quite lofty. The S&P trades at a forward PE of 18. And I agree, most of the S&P is a load of rubbish, but still, it's um, pretty lofty. What do high forward PE numbers mean? It just means you have a more volatile stock. That's typically what it means. So the moves tend to be a little bit bigger. But I don't mean to be gloom and doom about this. These challenges and risks are part of being an investor in high growth companies. The key is to be aware of them and factor them into your decision so you know what to do. So in our next segment, we're going to do a little bit of technical analysis here. I'll show you how to do it. I'll show you what it actually means. So I'm going to go and open up tradevision.io here. I will type Palantir into the top. There she is. And what do you see when you look at a stock chart like that? Very little, actually, I, I, would, I would argue. Yes, there are a couple of things we can see from up here, which is these sort of green and red bars, and let me explain them. So typically, I would go out into the third Friday of the month. That's usually where the biggest trading volume sits. And I would then look at the biggest red line here, which is a 27, and that's our support. So let me put a little, little line in here, sort of here. So 27 is our support. And then we look for the biggest green line, which is at 31, and that's our resistance. Not a lot above that, so that's basically the setup here. And again, put a little line on the chart. And these lines will get saved, they'll stay there, and it'll give you quite a lot of information because if the market moves higher, the stock price moves higher, you want these lines to move higher too. If they don't, you know you're a little bit in trouble. But if they do, you know the the rally's got something going for it. So that's kind of useful, but you need to look at something else. There is an indicator down here called MA50, the 50-day moving average line. It's a lovely little yellow line here. And generally speaking, when you break out above it, you are onto something good. So for example, we broke out here, rally. We broke out here, rally. You get the idea, we broke out here, rally. It's a pretty good indicator. There's a little bit more to it, but that's a pretty good thing to look at. So that's optimistic. We're above it. But what else is there to this? Well, we are in an uptrend. I think there's no denying that we are in an uptrend. The 50-day moving average line is sloping up. Uh, but we have created a bit of resistance up here above 
the 31, which is that recent high here, which sits around $33. And what we did after that was a little bit less great. You see that little top here, that one there? That was another high that was lower than the previous high. So you have high number one there, and then you have high number two here. And if the next second one is lower than the previous one, it's not brilliant. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to break through $31, and then you need to take out that high here, just that's below 32, and then you need to take out 33. So you're creating a, a multiple layer of resistance here above the, the price, and therefore, you're going to need something fairly juicy and bouncy for that to actually happen. The other thing I look at is, maybe get, to, let's get a different color here, is volume. So you get this beautiful rally up here, right? To the moon. And down here, the volume flattens out. And I'll zoom in a little on that for you. So you get that rally up. At the bottom here, these lines there, you can see, they're getting smaller and smaller and they're sort of going sideways. So... When you're on a rally, you want a lot of volume. So right now, this looks a bit more like a consolidation pattern rather than a real party. Is it time to kind of freak out about anything though at this point? No, I don't think it is. Although we want to stay, here is another high we want to stay above. We want to stay above this zone here, which would translate over sort of to here. We kind of tested that here. So we want to stay above that 29 and a bit. So right now, consolidation pattern, but we're not seeing the real like fireworks logic here. S&P inclusion would probably do it, but we may or may not get that. So watch out a little bit here. And there's one last thing you can also look at, which is the RSI, relative strength. It's sort of like the, uh, what's the internal pressure in the engine like? And it's this kind of whitish line here, and it applies to the chart on the left here. And generally speaking, when it's below 50, it's just lowish or in the mid range. When it's super low, like it was here in the 30s, down here even, uh, then you're typically oversold. When you're above 70, like we were up here, you're typically overbought. And fairly accurate indicator so far, if you compare it to the stock chart, right? The highs correspond with the highs on the chart. But right now, we're kind of in the middle. We're trending down, which isn't brilliant, but we're kind of in the middle, which also gives us room for upside. So we're kind of in like no man's land, and, and that's the case. Now, there is one thing that's very positive, though, and that is that in the last two years, we have not been higher than where we are right now. So all we got to do is take out that $31 resistance and then the $32.50, $33 resistance up here, and you do that and you got no nothing overhead, which is sort of clear skies to go as high as you want. So the potential is there for a significant rally, but we got to take out you know, $33 first. But it's important to always look at a chart and also look at what you don't want to happen. Like you don't want the stock to go down, probably, right? I don't. So what, what could make it go down and where would it go? Well, you could just get a broader market correction, just, you know, the September gloom or an election outcome the market doesn't like or the Fed doesn't cut rates enough or the recession shows up finally. Uh, we might get some earnings that are a little bit more uh, unexpected on the downside. We might get, I don't know, a delay in major government contracts, all sorts of stuff that could actually happen. So while I think generally, I'm generally a bull on the stock, I like the stock, but we need to be prepared, right? So what would we see? Well, what would I do if we drop below, say, this high here, 29.50? That would probably, for a trader's point of view, be the time to exit. And then if you drop below 27, and you'd also taken out the 50-day the moving average line, so you'd really come down here, then, well, where, where is the next support going to be at? It's going to be down here in the sort of 25, 26. And then worst case scenario, you go back down to the 20 range. And I'm saying, not saying that's going to happen, but it's always important to know that. And the way I set up trades is that I actually have my stop orders set up. So I know what's going to happen. I know when things are going to close. And like the last week here, where it was pretty choppy, yeah, a few things closed at losses, but they're small losses. And the things that are at nice profits we never let the profits turn into losers, and that's very, very important. If you master that discipline, you make so much more money than what most people do. They make a couple of thousand dollars on a trade, and then it goes back to zero, and then they lose money on it, and then they eat their hat, and they're very, very frustrated. So if you want to learn how we do that, my friend, come and join me next week.
at felixstrandsandorg.webinar, run a live trading training, we'll do an actual real trade together and everything else. And you can see how we set up those automations and why that's so incredibly important. So we've covered quite a lot of ground here today from the flood of institutional buying, which is optimistic, to the potential catalyst that could propel Palantir higher, as well as the challenges that it faces. We dissected a technical chart and even explored a bearish scenario and what that might look like. And what's the takeaway? Palantir is at a critical juncture. The potential inclusion in the S&P, improving financials and growing role in the AI revolution all have positive upside potential. But as always, the most important thing to do is what? Exactly. Do your own bloody research. Make the investment decisions that align with your goals and your risk tolerance. And always remember that knowledge and skill is actually what gets you there. And being prepared for what you don't want to happen is what gets you there. Hopium is not an investment strategy. As somebody said to me the other day, don't confuse brains with a bull market. <laughs> and there's a lot in that, right? Everyone's a genius when the market goes up. Uh, you kind of find out what's going on when the market goes down. And honestly, I enjoy a down market. We actually find it more easy to make money in a down market, even though we're 80% up so far this year. And of course, I'm very happy to share with you and teach you for free. So come and join me next week, felixfriends.org slash webinar. Until then, I wish you a beautiful. Until then, I wish you a beautiful investment journey. All the best. Today, we're diving into some game-changing developments from the e-commerce giant that you absolutely need to know about. Felix here, and of course, we're talking about Amazon. Amazon has just made two massive moves that are turning some serious heads in both the tech and the investment worlds. But what do these developments mean for Amazon's business model, future revenue streams, and most importantly, our investments. The implications are far-reaching and I've got all the details you need to make informed decisions on the basis of this, so we're going to get into that. Now, I know you are eager to get all the juicy details, but researching this story, I couldn't help but think about how crucial it is to stay ahead of the curve in today's fast-paced market. And it reminds me of how our teaching portfolio has managed to achieve exactly that with 80% gain so far this year. If you're curious how we managed that, it's part of our mission to make a million people financially free. I'm hosting a beginner trading training this coming week. You can grab yourself a free seat at felixfriends.org slash webinar. Back to Amazon. These recent moves signal a significant shift in the company's strategies, and we need to break down exactly what that means for investors like you. From potential new revenue streams to challenges on the horizon, we've got quite a lot to cover here. So stick around as we unpack this news and its implications for your portfolio. So let's dive into the heart of the matter. Amazon has made two moves that have caught the attention of investors and tech enthusiasts alike. First, Amazon has hired the founders of Covariant, an AI startup, along with about a quarter of their employees. They've also secured a non-exclusive license to use Covariant's robotic foundation models. This isn't just another acquisition, mind you. It's a strategic play that could revolutionize Amazon's warehouse operations and then some. You see, Covariant specializes in creating a